Please be seated. First of all, I want to thank Kimberly for her beautiful musical offerings this morning. They were truly beautiful and inspirational. And apropos of the title of the sermon this morning and an aptitude for gratitude, I want to say thank you because I'm grateful for the opportunity to preach in this sanctuary this morning. It's always a blessing to, to preach here at Dunwoody United Methodist Church. Will you pray with me, please? And now, O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When I was a freshman at the University of Virginia, that fall of my freshman year, of course it was a time when dinosaurs still roamed the earth and uh, all of that sort of thing, but when I was a freshman, I was eagerly awaiting the beginning of Fraternity Rush because UVA was a, um, a large school, at least for me at that time, and I was trying to find a place where I could fit in a place where I could belong. And so when Fraternity Rush started, this sort of awkward dance between the, the entering freshmen and, and, uh, and the, the brothers of the fraternity, where you tried to find the house where the chemistry was the best and you fit in and they liked you and you liked them and all of that sort of thing, with, as I was beginning that, that, uh, that awkward dance with them on all of that, I would go from house to house. And over the course of a, a couple of weeks, you began to narrow down, and they began to narrow down who were the matches and all of that. So I was going back to this one particular house uh, where I really enjoyed the, the fellows that I met at that house. But something interesting happened every time I went to this house. Somebody would ask me a question, and the question was this, are you an M.O.T.? Well, I had no earthly idea what an M.O.T. was, but it took about three tries before I finally got up the courage to ask somebody, well, I don't know, but what is an M.O.T.? And what he told me as he was laughing, he said, well, an M.O.T. is a member of the tribe. You see, about 50% of that fraternity was Jewish. And so an M.O.T. was a member of the tribe of Abraham. Well, theology notwithstanding, I found a lot of good friends in that fraternity. I joined that fraternity. I had a good experience there. I, um, I was nurtured and encouraged in that fraternity, and it turned out to be a very good tribe for me. Tribes are often good, but sometimes tribes are not so good. That very same winter, I was playing basketball in an intramural league at, uh, at UVA, and it was uh, sort of that my fraternity wasn't known as being a particularly athletic fraternity. And so when it happened one night that our fraternity uh, was able to beat one of the, uh, the larger fraternities where everybody was, a, um, everybody was an All-American and um, everybody um, was, was a Protestant, um, it, <laughs> it made the news in the, the, the daily... Cavalier Daily newspaper. But it also turned out that the, the writer of the article was obviously from a different tribe than I was. Because what came out in the article was that Sid Lauderstein, he didn't, he didn't think my name sounded Jewish enough, so he converted it to Sid Lauderstein, and that Sid Lauderstein had scored 24 points in an upset victory over this other fraternity. Well, I was somewhat taken aback at this. I thought it was perhaps a slur on some of my esteemed fraternity brothers. And so I hurriedly took the newspaper back to the fraternity house and started to grumble about it. They thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and from then on, my nickname in the fraternity was Sid. <laughs> you see, there's some very good things about tribes and there's some not so good things about tribes also. I was reading a book this summer by authors Delaz, Keen, and Parks. It's called Common Fire, Leading Lives of Commitment in a Complex World. It's just the sort of thing you pick up, everybody picks up on the beach as a light read. Um, and I was, I was reading the book, and um, it was talking about tribalism. 
tribalism as a phenomena in our country, tribalism referring to our allegiance to folks where we find that we have a common bond. Perhaps it's the common bond of family. Perhaps it's the common bond of school ties. Perhaps it's the common bond of country or country of origin. Perhaps it's the common bond of what we look like or what we think like. And a lot of times these tribes tend to nurture and encourage us, but tribes also sometimes tend to build boundaries around themselves to insulate themselves, and sometimes those boundaries are not so good. In the history of America, most small towns were were built with a town square, or in New England they called them commons. It was an area in the center of town where people from different tribes, if you will, could get together and work out the differences, find the common ground, going to the commons to find the common ground. But as we have become more and more complex as a society and we have joined more and more tribes and we have affiliated with more and more tribes, we have become much more urban And physically, as well as I think to some degree spiritually, those commons, those areas where we come together to work out our differences have begun to disappear. More and more we have been unable to resolve our differences, and so we simply label people by the characteristics to which we ascribe their tribe. Sometimes these these labels are good labels sometimes not so good labels. And we have labels like red states and and blue states. We have labels like conservative and liberal. We have labels like black and white. We have labels like gay and straight. We have labels like Muslim and Christian. And oftentimes the boundaries that we build around the labels that we we put on other people, those boundaries that we build, get far too high and cause us problems. And I think as I read the scripture uh, for this morning's sermon, what is involved in that scripture, Luke paints for us an intricate picture, and he focuses on some of the negative aspects of tribalism as a phenomenon. Think back to the to the words that were, that were so eloquently read just a few moments ago. Simon is a Pharisee. He's a member of an elite tribe, is he not? He's wealthy. He has status. He's important. And whenever a visiting preacher was coming into town, a Pharisee like Simon would be obliged to invite that visiting preacher to come and have dinner with him. And so that's exactly what he does. He invites him to come in. Now, Simon's house was probably like most houses of the time for wealthy people. There would be the house proper, and then there would be a courtyard, and on the other side of the courtyard was an open gate. And frequently, when the weather was good, people would dine in that courtyard. There would be a low table in the center of the courtyard, and the guests would recline with their feet pointing outward for the dinner. And just as frequently, if someone was passing by, they could see that there was someone important in the courtyard and they might wander in and and see. And that's, of course, what this woman who was sinful did. She wandered in. But there were three cardinal rules of hospitality. Simon should have known these rules and should have obeyed these rules. And the first rule was this, that when a visitor comes in, you offer them water to bathe their feet. People were walking around in sandals all day. And the roads were dusty, so you offered them some water for their feet. The second rule was that you would greet a guest with a kiss on the cheek. And the third rule was that you would offer them uh, some basically what amounted to perfume because people didn't bathe as often and if you really wanted to enjoy your dinner sometimes it was a little bit better to to uh, change the odor well Simon didn't do any of those three things Simon the one who should have known better did not observe the rules of hospitality the woman on the other hand 
This woman who all we really know about her is that she is a sinner. She wanders into a courtyard where she is most decidedly not welcome. And when she goes in, she goes immediately to Jesus and she begins to cry and she bathes his feet in her tears and then she wipes his feet dry with her hair. And then she begins to kiss his feet and takes the alabaster jar that has the ointment, the expensive ointment in it, and she begins to massage that ointment into his feet. The woman, the sinful woman, observes the rules of hospitality, but the wise Pharisee does not. The woman models hospitality but Simon simply models disapproval. What transpires here, of course, is a story within the story. Jesus begins to tell this story of the two debtors who are forgiven, and he explains the significance of the story. And when he's done explaining the significance of the story, it's clear that the woman understands what he's talking about, but Simon the Pharisee does not. Why does the sinful woman understand why does she get it and why does the wise Pharisee not get it? Well, I have a theory about that. And my theory is that this woman had an aptitude for gratitude. And Simon, on the other hand, was only interested in preserving his own lifestyle. He was only interested in, in maintaining the status quo and keeping things the way that they were. Simon was not open to receive Jesus' perspective, a new perspective perhaps, to something that he was not used to. And so Simon misses out on an opportunity, an opportunity to have an exchange, a meaningful exchange, a, a dialogue, if you will, with Jesus Christ. The woman is, has an aptitude for gratitude, but Simon is too entrenched in the status quo. His ability to understand, you might say, was disabled. Now, if the, all of this sounds distressingly like the evening news to you, if it sounds like the things that you he, read in the newspaper or the things that you hear on the radio, there's a good reason for that, because I think we suffer from tribalism today as well. And yes, we are affiliated with numerous tribes in our lives, and our lives are terribly complex, but others still label us and ascribe to us the characteristics of the tribes that they think we belong to. And maybe the characteristics are accurate, but often they are not. See, when tribalism gets very bad, then a white supremacist can go into the Bible study at an African-American church and murder nine people. And all people can focus on is the symbolism of the flag. When tribalism gets too heavy, a young man can die in the back of a police van. And all people can do is to, to riot. When tribalism gets too heavy and, and too prominent, then, and when the Supreme Court rules that gay marriage is all right, then some people threaten to dissolve the church over that one issue. When tribalism just overcomes us, then a Muslim gunman can walk into a recruiting center and murder four Marines. And the result is just an intensification of all of the hate rhetoric that takes place between us and them. So is Jesus against tribal affiliations? Of course not. Of course not. In our text today, Jesus invites this woman to be part of his tribe. Jesus is in favor of tribes. But Jesus says that's not the real question here. 
The real question that Jesus wants us to focus on is whom do you worship? Do you worship the gods of the tribes? Or do you worship God? What we have in our text today is a story within a story within a story. See, Jesus doesn't just encourage the woman in our story today. No, Jesus invites her to be part of his, his tribe. Jesus doesn't chastise her because she is a sinner. No, Jesus goes and forgives her. Jesus doesn't just recognize that she is faithful. No, Jesus transforms her. Because Jesus offers himself as the common ground that we all so desperately need, that place where we can work out our differences together. See, at the end of the day, what distinguishes the woman from Simon is not her status, and it is not her theology. What distinguishes the woman from Simon is her aptitude for gratitude, her willingness to accept and recognize Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. So we have to ask ourselves this question. With whom in this story, with whom do we identify ourselves? Do we identify ourselves with the woman? Do we identify ourselves as sinners? Do we identify ourselves as people who need to be forgiven? Or perhaps do we identify ourselves with Simon, mostly righteous people, mostly, but sometimes self-righteous? Or perhaps we might identify ourselves with those bystanders, you know, those, those other people that were in the courtyard that day, they're sort of hovering on the periphery, mumbling and murmuring. Do we identify with them? Or perhaps, just perhaps, do we identify with each of these three at different times? See, this reminds me of another story about Jesus with a Pharisee. A Pharisee comes up to Jesus and tries to trap Jesus, and he says, he says, Jesus, which commandment is the greatest? And Jesus answers the man with a question. He says, well, what do you say is the greatest? And the man gets it right, he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And Jesus says, you got it. But there's more to it than that. The second commandment is like unto the first. And that is you are to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says that all of the law hangs on these two commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. It all hangs on that because if we can only see things through the lens of our own tribalism we too might miss out on the presence of the risen Lord in our lives but there's good news and the good news is that we all can have an aptitude for gratitude in our lives we all have that ability to overcome our tribal boundaries if we will simply allow ourselves to be transformed by Jesus Christ. And then we can experience the blessings of that commandment. We can experience the blessings of being loved by God and loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. We can experience those blessings. So how do we cultivate our aptitude? for gratitude. Well, last Sunday you heard about being intentional, that we need to be intentional, and perhaps some of you got your, your prayer rocks. And if you don't have prayer rocks, there's some in a basket that are out in the, in the narthex at, the, at the, guest, the guest desk. These prayer rocks help us to be intentional because every time you feel this prayer rock in your pocket or you see it on your desk, pick it up rub it. Remember your blessings and give a prayer of thanks to God for those blessings that you have in your life. 
and you will cultivate an aptitude for gratitude. Another thing that you need to be intentional about is learning about God. Consider doing a Bible study this fall. We have a number of offerings that I think you would find very helpful. You know, isn't it amazing what we find out when we try to learn more about God instead of just trying to get God and to come be a member of our tribe and convince Him about our stuff? Isn't it amazing what can happen when we allow Him to give, convince us about His stuff? And you can be intentional about your aptitude for gratitude and growing that by, by your witness, by your actions, by doing something, by being part of the, the many mission activities of this church. Family Promise is coming up in just a few weeks. If you haven't done that, it's a, it's a great opportunity. Food stock registrations are online now. This afternoon, you can go home and register for food stock. Mission Mondays are continuing. The great day of service is just ahead of us. There are many, many more mission activities of the church. And if you have any question about what you can be involved in, then, then call Samantha Faclaris at our, of our church staff. She's our director of missions, and she can get you lined up with something very, very quickly. The fact of the matter is that we are all sinners, that we all have a lot to learn, that we all make mistakes. But another fact of the matter is that we all have an aptitude for gratitude. And when we cultivate that attitude for gratitude, we begin to understand. Webster defines aptitude as the ability to learn or the ability to understand. How's your aptitude for gratitude this morning? Is it high? If your aptitude for gratitude is high, that, that translates into a willingness to receive Christ into your heart this day. And when we do, when we do, nothing will ever be the same again. At the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Thy kingdom come, Lord. When we have an aptitude for gratitude. We can be intentional about making that prayer come true and building God's kingdom here on earth. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we conclude our worship service this morning, we will...